good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Lara Joy of the Port Heritage Communications Group, and I'd like to welcome you to the third and uh, last lecture in our series on the Victorian Port and in particular the Diving Bell. Uh, over the last three weeks, we had the engineering historian uh, Dr. Ron Cox uh, talk about uh, Binda Bloodstoney, the famous Victorian uh, engineer who played a big impact on Dublin City but also on the port. And then last week, uh, Eamon O'Reilly, chief executive of the company, uh, talked about Dublin Port and its links to the city. And, and both of those talks are now available uh, on our YouTube uh, channel if you want to, to, to see them after tonight's talk. Tonight's talk is uh, by Jim Kelleher, uh, and it's going to be on the diving bell, the object that became a museum, uh, this wonderful, uh, iconic uh, uh, diving bell, which is now on Sir Rogerson's Quay uh, since 2015 as, a, as its own separate museum. Uh, and Jim will explain uh, the, the history of the bell, but also uh, in particular the amazing work that happened to create that museum. Uh, Jim, uh, just to give you a short bio, has uh, also works for the Port Heritage and Communications Group as the head of special projects. And in this role, he's led and designed and delivered uh, award-winning port city integration projects, uh, including uh, the diving bell. Jim is a graduate of DIT and DMU in, Le in Leicester in the UK, and is a member of the Chartered Institute of Building and Institute and also the Institute of Project Management. Uh, like all of us, I think, in uh, Port Heritage and Communication, Jim uh, is very, very passionate about the history of Dublin uh, and in particular Dublin Port. So tonight, um, Jim, if you want to take us away there, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Lara, for that, um, for that introduction. I've obviously uh, two very fine acts to try and follow tonight, which I'll attempt to do so in the next 40 minutes. Um, my presentation will be primarily visual, um, an eclectic mix of photographs, graphics, and some anecdotes along the way for, uh, for added interest. So the running order tonight will be uh, give you an introduction uh, to the project and also to the object, which is the diving bell. Um, I'll go through a little bit of a, a back catalogue of what we've assembled in terms of imagery over the, the uh, century and a half. Um, I'll talk about visitors to date, um, some future plans we have, and then I'll, come, uh, I'll finish up with a three minute time lapse video of how the works were completed over a six month period. And then um, we'd welcome obviously any questions and answers you may have. So I'll crack on. So Frank McNally in September, 2015 wrote very glowingly about the diving bell and now suddenly it's Dublin's newest museum, a miniature one to be sure, but packing more fascination per square meter than most of the others. Yes, it's a small project on the scale of things we do at Dublin Port, but a very important one in terms of our first steps and our first physical intervention into the public realm and into what we call our tangible soft values. In terms of its location and setting the scene within the context of the city and the port, uh, that's an overview. Circled on the left uh, is the position, current position of the diving bell on Sir John Rogerson's Quay. You can see the distance right down to uh, the Poolbeg Lighthouse in between the north and south ports, the surrounding dockland areas, local communities, um, our greenway to northern perimeter, our Liffey to talk a project joining in with that, uh, Eamon. Uh, mentioned these last week. I'll come back to that later on. Uh, to put it into more of a, a satellite, uh, more familiar context, uh, and I've highlighted the diving bell there uh, to the left of your screen. So you can see it's within the city, um, but close to the port, uh, where the hinterland of the old port and docks was. So this beautiful restored, digitally restored um, drawing is the first glimpse we get uh, in our drawing archive um, of the diving bell. Now the primary focus of the of the drawing was actually the diving bell float, which you'll see in the right hand side, you'll actually see the diving bell. And I'd like to thank Marta uh, Lopez and our, and our um, one of our colleagues for digitally restoring this uh, recently. I've also circled Bindon Bloodstoney's very distinctive initials signed off 1871 uh, and that's typical of the oversight and care the man took uh, in his designs. Um, so zooming in on that portion, that very folded uh, portion of the drawing, um, a couple of things to note. First of all, the 
quality of the draftsmanship, uh, the ink and pen, the watercolor wash, uh, the bell, the materiality of it is 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 captured with with color. Payne's gray for cast iron, and that was typically used as a as a, a conventional indication of materials in old architectural and engineering drawings, really up to um, up to the the time of of modern computer aided design. Um, so the dimensions of it are, are, are described there, 20 foot square at its base, six and a half foot in height to the roof, 44 foot to the top of the funnel. I'll talk a bit about that because that's how the workmen had to get down into it. Uh, and then behind it is the, the end view of the float. So a section through it, just showing its workings. Um, Ron may have included this in his superb lecture as well. Uh, but it shows the dimensions of the funnel, three foot. Uh, the men would climb the step irons, go down into an airlock, be decompressed, and go down into, uh, into the bell chamber, drop into it, obviously after the water had been blown out by compressed air. But that's a lovely illustration. We used it in the, um, the interpretive panels as well, and it's, um, it's just a very nice way of describing it. Um, also, just in terms of further references, there's, there's fantastic um, other resources in terms of videos on YouTube available at our website. We'll just put one up there and they'll be available after the lecture as well. Uh, another drawing that Marta discovered for us, which is the top view of the diving bell, um, pen on linen, bent and bloodstone. He has a note, I'll zoom in on it. But um, he left no detail to chance um, He's putting in um, signal gear for the men and the work uh, in the diving bell uh, and describes in the drawing how this is to work. It's dated 1870. Um, there's his note. You can actually see the linen. You see his, his scribe, his writing um, and his instructions on it. So it's typical of the man. He took great care in this regard. Um, there's a workman. I don't know his name. Um, somebody else probably in the audience do, and I apologize that I don't, but it just shows him getting in to the funnel and the uh, the guardrail at the top, and it's been well used at that point um, and how we got into it. So speaking about some of the men who worked in it, uh, I'll just briefly go through what some of them said, and we have some great oral testimony uh, on that. Um, Joe Murphy, who was a diving, uh, who was at the Dublin Port Diver, when interviewed for RTE Nationwide and Seascapes in the year 2000, said it's a masterpiece because nowhere in Europe that I know of has a diving bell like that. To go down 40 foot, 42 feet, 20 foot square, blow the water out so the five men can work in reasonable comfort. John Riley said, well, it was hard pick and shovel work, working under compressed air, working working at 45 foot uh, below high water and we were under 20 pounds a square inch. Uh, Tommy, Tom McSweeney, who interviewed the man, said and described in his Seascapes program of 2000 that it was one of the most unusual pieces of maritime engineering ever devised. That it surely was. So I've tried to assemble a couple of images uh, of the object that is the diving bell um, over time. Um, here's an interesting one, circa 1922, during the Civil War, preparations for the Cork landings, we assume they're loading uh, an armoured car onto a ship and um, a mixture of free state troops in uniform and without, side by side with dockers and what's in the background with this fantastic sculptural form, the iconic diving bell. 1923, caissons are being floated in. The new technology is almost floating by the old. The, um, the diving bell here is really a passive observer to the new technology, which was caisson construction for key walls. I'm not gonna cover that within this lecture. It's a whole lecture unto itself, but uh, it's a very interesting photograph. Um, another one later from the 1940s shows the diving bell lying on top of what we assume is a caisson. 
the hall silos, um, or the modern day r &H hall silos are in the background. The Irish silos of um, Odlums can be seen as well emerging. So we know it's possibly the early 1940s. And then we have these, this beauty of uh, an aerial image uh, dating from the 1970s prior to the construction of Port Center. Um, a lot of the old port is still intact. You have the Graving Docks 1, Graving Dock 2, the Patent Slip, the Alexandra Basin, the Hunter Ton Crane, and all the sheds that were located there. And sitting in the water in the Alex Basin is our diving bell. Um, moving on to more modern era, 1991, after it was rescued by uh, local community, community activists, including retired and current members of the port, it was placed on Sir John Rogerson's Quay. Uh, that's the ferryman in the background. Uh, zooming in a bit closer, you can see it received some uh, graffiti treatment or vandalism, depending on your point of view. Um, that's another view from the other angle. And then in 2000, um, which formed um, the content of that Seascapes nationwide program, I was referring to the works to save the diving bell that had been taken out of the water. They undertook corrosion prevention works. They rebuilt the funnel, which was in a bad state. They kept the original items like the step irons, and they did a fantastic job. And I'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, so that's just a still, a still from the uh, from the from the video itself of that. Um, so yes, in two thousand, under a Millennium project, there was funding acquired, and it was a combination and a collaboration. But great credit due to local community and, as I say, the current and retired staff of Dublin Port to to save it, to place it onto Sir John Rogerson's key. Uh, it was almost the one that got away. So there it lay, um, you know, an object of curiosity, unless you knew where you were from, the local community, or had some connection with the port, what was it? Um, Portholes have been cut in it to allow people view in and see the workings underneath. Um, that's it for the city facing um, angle. Received some, obviously the graffiti artists are very active in that area. A uh, shot of the interior, so um, some of the features, the, the portal from the funnel in, uh, the ballast plates, the bolting together, uh, the chains that held up the stage or the, um, the carrier where the men would put up the material that they were digging out with pick and shovel uh, and some other accoutrements, including the, the, uh, including the spider's webs. Um, interesting to note then the, um, the cast glass lights that were put in prior to electricity. I'm presuming they, they lit it with lamps after that. Um, so it was a tight space to work in. If you're a six footer, you had a risk of uh, hitting your head at times. So that was the condition we, we, we got it in when we started to think about the project to reconfigure it. So in terms of the project and its origins, um, it really came out of our, our our master plan 2012 2040 with Jamin O'Reilly, our new chief executive at the time, led one of the very important influencing documents within, uh, within the project. Uh, Origins was really the soft values of Seaport's concept that, um, that Eric van Hoedunk, um came up with. And within the, uh, within the master plan, it was recognized that it was a piece of immovable port heritage. The links between the port and the city can be enhanced through the preservation or reinstallation of some immovable port heritage on the city keys, and that we did. And then Sean O'Leary, who was the uh, architect in MOLA Architecture, wrote a very influential and seminal document for ourselves, really, in terms of putting together a soft values project strategic framework. And within that, it was identified as a priority soft values project. So that was back in 2012. Um, so the origins to the reconfiguring of the diving bell and the project. In terms of the timeline for doing it, um, and the backdrop there is the hoarding when we eventually did get the site, but it was a three year between conceptual design, sign offs, uh, more detailed planning design, acquisition of consents, 
uh, and then going out to the market to get somebody to build it for us and get our own internal approvals um, really was from 2012 to 2015, a three year period. Um, so how did we do it? Well, our architects were superb. Mola Architecture, Sean O'Leary and Kieran Fitzgerald really um, brought the sculptural form uh, of the diving bell to the fore and they assembled a fantastic team uh, underneath them to do that. So it was an architectural led project. So going back to old Vitruvius and his, his um, principles of good architectural design, commodity firmness and delight. But what does that mean in the 21st century? Really means build quality, functionality and impact. Um, and that was all very important in the project besides all the other uh, modern project management uh, demands that a project like this will bring in terms of managing cost, time, risk, procurement, communications, and all those various uh, elements. Um, so that matrix there, are, this is really, I suppose I'm just giving you an indication of the process we went through. It really had to tick the box of excellence on all these items for urban and social integration, read port integration, for form and materials, I'll come back to that a bit later on, character and in, in, innovation and how we did the lighting and illumination of it, access, space, use, construction, uh, its performance, its engineering systems, how the water feature, which I'll talk about as well, works. Um, so there's the design construction team. The danger with, a, with, with, with putting up a slide like that is that you invariably forget somebody. And I hope I haven't. If I have, uh, please forgive me. Um, but the slide is almost as packed as the site was during the construction phase. But you can see we have a wide range of actors and influencers here from um, our lead architects, Mola, to our builder, Wesson Construction. And sometimes builders don't get the credit due to them. They um, they have to put into practice what the design says on paper and they have to do it on site and take the risks of doing it and bring to bear innovative methods uh, and, and ways of doing that. Um, so there's a whole host of people there and they were all um, superb during it. Uh, like all projects, we made a few bumps on the way, but through good communications and a collaborative approach, uh, we resolved all issues of an interesting one that I'll, I'll point out to you, which needed some thinking outside of the box. Um, but the key features of the design without going too heavy into the architectural concepts of it were really high quality in all regards, materials, design, layout, uh, had to be robust yet attractive, had to encounter and, and be prepared to encounter, encounter the saline environment, marine grade materials, uh, match existing public realm streetscape. It was within the Dublin City Council uh, capture on the south. Uh, and we need to also consider vandal and antisocial considerations within it too. Uh, in terms of materiality, forgive me if I digress a little bit, but um, one of my favourite rock bands is uh, British Sea Power. And um, their first album, uh, one of the, uh, the lyrics from it really describes what the materials have to be about. And it's, it's always, always the sea and how you respond to a saline or even a brackish environment when you, when you play something as important as this uh, near, near the sea. The bell itself is made up of 25 um, cast iron casings. Cast iron was the, the material of the Victorian era. It was used in all sorts of applications from street furniture to structural columns, um, to railings. Um, so it was, it was a massive, a massive, um, massively popular material. They started to understand its boundaries. And Ron referred to, to where the diving bell was built. It was Grandin, Grandin and Company of Drogheda. How we got it down, we're assuming they, they brought it down on the, on the diving bell barge. Um, but it was some feat to cast it in such great, uh, great quality. Um, and was bolted together. And its condition was very good, um, bar the superficial uh, patina of age and grime and, and, and um, graffiti, but it was in very good condition overall when we got to it. Uh, in terms of the layout and the interior, well, one of the key things that the architects wanted to achieve was this sense of an incline down, you were going down into something, 
a bit like what the uh, the workmen uh, would have to do. So the central space was the exhibition space and around its walls were the interpretive panels. Uh, the areas to the side were utilized really as a service areas and the wing screen wing walls uh, bared the, the, the name Diving Bell, which was a key uh, initial concept which Vision, uh, Vivian Roach and Sean O'Leary uh, proposed. And then to lift the actual sculptural form, the, the 80 tons of cast iron uh, above head height to allow access in and appreciation of the actual object. The object at this point became the object theater uh, of the scheme. Uh, bring people in, explain in a very uh, entertaining manner with good graphics, good graphic and narrative interpretation, but also allow them to see what it was like within it and its workings. In terms of how we did it or how the structural engineers and the builders did it, well, it was built on a reinforced concrete mat foundation, a big raft of concrete with steel in it. Um, I won't go into too many building terms on this, but, uh, and then the wing walls were, were supported by traditional strip foundations. But to, to go up, we had to go down, first of all. Um, structural steel support frame would then be laid uh, upon the, uh, the foundations, which were below ground. And then also the, the pit for the water feature had to be um, created within that. Uh, and then supported the 90 tons of the bell itself and the funnel. Um, yeah, this is the mystery cable. This is one of the first hitches we met on the project. Uh, we were all scratching our heads for about a week. So that's a week's delay on a, on a project. What's, what is it all about? The, um, the mystery electrical cable, which carried a high voltage or was assumed to carry a high voltage until otherwise proved. Uh, we couldn't find it. It wasn't picked up on any charts. It was at a depth that wasn't picked up prior to, to the construction work. Um, it was a bit of a mystery. ESB didn't know. Uh, local inquiries didn't know. Um, and yet we had to treat it carefully with modern health and safety uh, requirements. We had to treat it as if it was live. So then we kind of scratched our heads a bit further and Phil Linnett popped into my mind. Um, his famous old song, uh, old song, Old Town, dated from 1982. I had a childhood recollection myself of a video. I knew that was Sir John Rogerson's key because the gasometer was right along beside. So that gave us a lead. Um, the cable turned out to be an electrical cable that serviced the conveyor and cranes that demolished the, uh, the gasometer at the time. Um, and with that, we got on with the project. There was no more uh, delay on it. It was a dead cable. We finally excavated it further down and found it out. But Phil Linnett helped us. Um, this is what we're trying to build, the foundation and the pit tanked off for the water feature. The water feature floor itself um, was an optional feature. We decided in the end, in terms of scope, to bring it in. We thought it would add some serious interest in terms of the sound of water washing over it, uh, what that water sounded like for the men who worked into it, you know, worked in the bell when it was flushed out with compressed air. Uh, and it was just, um, I suppose, um, a very interesting feature to, to achieve. And we were quite happy to, uh, to bring it into the scheme and get it to work. So um, further credit due to the mechanical and electrical engineers that um, proved the solution for it. Um, there's a photograph from the site. You can see how constrained the site it was. Um, and one of the big challenges um, after the cable was, how do we lift it? How do you lift a bell of that weight beside a public thoroughfare, uh, deal with all the neighboring um, stakeholders who were cheek by jowl, a bus route in between, uh, and how do you lift that? Uh, so it was done late at night, a dual tandem, massive crane lift, had to be lifted twice. Um, the works to sandblast it down to its parent material uh, were done on site uh, under strict environmental control, obviously for sound and neighborhood issues. And then it was painted up in um, a very specific paint system. The uh, the paint color was an architectural choice, which we agreed, client 
fully agreed and endorsed it. And it was it was a risky one, but one that uh, paid off. Bright orange, it can be seen, high visual impact. Uh, it was a superb choice uh, in the end. The interpretive panels, and I'll talk more about uh, Mary, the great late uh, Mary Mulvihill uh, in a short while. But Mary was instrumental in pulling together the interesting narrative that would appeal to all people. Um, of, of all ages and backgrounds, really, and that's just an example of some of the panels. But there's twelve panels within the the um, within the bell itself. Uh, there is a contemporary kind of uh, interior shot. They're backlit for illumination in low light and nighttime conditions. The interior of the bell was kept intact, as were its features, its chains, its brackets. Um, unfortunately, the stage is where they would put the material up on. We presume they were timber; they'd long gone. Um, the old portholes that were put in in 2000. Um, so all its warts and ev evolutions during its, its, its use uh, were, were, were kept and can be seen. The illumination strategy was to uh, light, it, light its main elements at night time, but then also um, be programmable to, to, to basically to, to put a color on it for a certain team. Uh, Patrick's Day Green, Christmas Red, um, Dublin in September, obviously blue uh, for the last few years. Hopefully that will continue. Um, and then at the end of the six months construction period on site, we had a fantastic uh, opening. We had a hard, hard deadline to get to the, the sail ship. Uh, Key to Muck was coming into port. and We wanted it uh, ready for the June bank holiday weekend for that. That's a picture of Betty Ash, one of the heroes of, uh, of this project and the early stages of saving the diving bell uh, for the St. Andrews Resource Centre uh, with Pascal Donoghue, who was the uh, Minister of Transport at the time, cutting the ribbon. Um, and there's a sail ship, Kitamok, which is the Mexican Navy's um, tall ship for sail trailing. Um, superb. Uh, sight to behold coming into port and staying in port and stayed for the weekend uh, and people could visit it and we had our diving bell newly opened and illuminated for that very um, for that very uh, time there's an early morning shot of it um, towards the city during the dawn light um, so you can see how the project achieved that uh, raising it off the ground its sculptural form, its bright colour, um, all original uh, items of industrial heritage, its step irons uh, were all kept intact and looked after. Um, it's picked up a couple of awards and it's, the project wasn't about getting awards or accolades, um, but this was a very interesting and nice one. It was from the Industrial Heritage Association of Ireland. Um, and that's that's Lucy McCaffrey, who was our chairperson at the time, who was very supportive of the project with the project sponsor, who was the chief executive, Eamon O'Reilly. Um, sorry, he's not pictured there, but um, uh, myself then and Kieran Fitzgerald, who was the project architect as well. Mary Mulvihill, um, I'd like to pay great tribute to Mary because uh, without Mary, uh, we wouldn't have had the, the brilliant interpretive panels that we have within the scheme. Um, she was a greatly respected um, scientist, uh, worked with her company in Genius Ireland, and I had many a very engaging workshop with her in terms of um, getting the narrative right for the, for the panels, um, for the interior, uh, for the museum. And uh, Mary was, as many of you know, I'm sure was an award-winning science writer and broadcaster and media consultant for over 25 years. Sadly, uh, Mary um, passed away during the construction period, um, but a very nice kind of fitting um, thing happened during that job. The day that our interpretive panels arrived on site was the day that Mary uh, passed away. Um, to me, what's more important than any accolade or award is who's coming to see it and is it relevant to them. Hard to measure, of course, but what we did do is we implemented uh, video analytics technology to answer the question we were being asked: how many people are uh, how many people are visiting the diving bell? And for the year 2019, 
Um, the year before COVID, uh, we had almost 70,000 people. The year before that, we believe it was around 80,000. Um, and we'll continue to monitor that when um, things hopefully open up a bit more um, when COVID goes away. The future, and I know Eamon touched on this last week, uh, but I thought I'd put it up again, given its relevance to the distributed museum and the starting point of it, which is our diving bell on um, Sir John Rogerson's Quay. Um, some of the future projects Lara and myself are involved in is really the, uh, the Liffey Talca, which is 1.4 um, public realm cycleway and walkway between the Liffey and the Talca, and then our heritage area, which will be opening um, at the graving docks later on in the summertime, uh, which I have a picture of here. Um, I'll go back to the last one just to fill the full picture. But the, the Greenway as well, the Talca Estuary Greenway, which has commenced on site, and that would be a fantastic uh, amenity, as would the Liffey Talca project to the citizens of Dublin in terms of uh, not only amenity, somewhere to walk uh, and see unrivaled views of the bay. Um, I take in the port as well and be able to get in to previously inaccessible areas of the port. Um, some further reading and resources, I have a list there, we can, we can distribute that to anybody who's interested afterwards, but there's some interesting material and I haven't, I haven't um, covered everything, but Sean O'Leary has written a fantastic article in um, a recent book, Dublin by Design, Architecture in the City, uh, and he speaks about the place of culture and Olivia, the river. Uh, mentions the diving bell and some other projects that he was instrumental in in bringing such great uh, him and his team bringing some great such great design to uh, McNally's there as well one or two that I, I uh, was involved in myself and our own yearbooks have great material as do uh, our website in terms of um, YouTube YouTube channels uh, and further outreach uh, information including what it sounded like to work within the, the diving bell. Um, and then there was a couple of radio interviews done at the time. Eamon did one, I know, for Lyric FM, and I did one myself with Drive Time. Um, okay, I'm sort of coming to the end of, of uh, the formal part of the lecture. I'd like to thank uh, Eamon O'Reilly for the project sponsor for um, the support during the project itself. Uh, and then for this for this uh, series of lectures to, to Lara join the team in the Port Heritage, Heritage and Communications Group. Uh, and then to Jimmy and Rachel Murray for some of those photographs of the rescued bell up on Sir John Rogerson's Quay. <clears throat> and then um, also Bindon Blood Stoney, who's left us such a great legacy um, in the port and some of the things we, 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 uh, we've been left with, including the Alex, the Alex Basin. Um, if you're walking by, passing by the Eastwall Road, please do look in. There are some hidden gems, including um, a recent icon of Bindon that is now um, placed on the end of one of the modern, modern um, conveyors at the port. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and attendance. Uh, this evening. I have a short, um, like I say, three minutes time lapse, uh, illustrates very well how, um, how the job was done on site.
Thank you, Jim. That was a, a wonderful talk uh, and uh, a fascinating insight. And I think particularly that last three minute video there gives you uh, an idea of the work that it takes to take something uh, like the diving bell and turn it into a really wonderful uh, visit. Uh, and as you say, the interpretation that Mary did um, and yourself was just a spectacular and really kind of brings it to life once you, you, you walk through it. Um, just some, some of the questions, one from Joe Ryan. Um, captivating presentation, uh, Jim. Is it true that the cast iron is so thick that Hammond Lane were not interested in scrapping it? And that's uh, one of the reasons why it survived for so long. It's a very interesting question. Um, in our experience, Lair, <laughs> we know a lot went to Hammond Lane over the years. I hadn't heard that before. It's a very interesting anecdote. Um, we know that they were uh, one foot thick uh, between the ballast plate and the actual plates themselves. Um, so it really was a heavy duty piece of piece of material. Moving it anywhere was was um, cumbersome and awkward without particularly seeing that the um, and Ron covered this that the the float itself had been scrapped, um, I think, in the 60s. So um, it actually it took the Mersey Mammoth, which is a massive uh, marine crane that was in port doing work um, to bring it up to Sir John Rogerson's key. It was opportune at the time in the 90s to do that. Um, so that's an interesting one. Thanks, Joe, for that, that, uh, that question. Another question from Dermot is, is there a PDF publication on the diving bell? Sorry, Lars, or what? Is there a, a publication on the, on the diving bell? Has a book been published with all the work that went into it? Uh, no, no, there hasn't. Um, I suppose there's a combination of resources, um, you know, historic ones relating to Ron Cox's beautiful publication on Bind and Bloodstone. He has some nice imagery on it. Um, our images uh, within our yearbooks and um, I suppose some of the journals that it's appeared in, but no, nothing okay. to date. But there's, there's a good idea. Um, as, right, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned during Ron's uh, talk, we're, we're going to republish his, his two books on the two port engineers. Uh, and maybe it's time to, to, uh, to do something specifically on uh, the diving bell because uh, not everyone has a chance to, to, to read all the, the detail in the, the wonderful graphic panels that are there. Um, um, but just to, to remind people that um, Mary's book, uh, Ingenious Ireland, was republished uh, a couple, uh, I think two years ago, uh, is republished again, so it is in the bookshop. So if you haven't purchased it, it's really well worth uh, a read. Um, message from Owen, St. Andrews did a book on the diving bell uh, and it can be found in, in, um, in your library. So we'll have to look at that and uh, maybe uh, Sorry, take Sorry, I should have remembered that. Quite right, they did. They did about the time of the Millennium Project. Sorry, they did do that one, yeah. Okay. And from Cottle, do you know how many years that the, the diving bell was in operation? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here now, Lar, but 1869 to about 1959. That's what I've, uh, yeah, what I've read from, and heard. From what the records are saying, that's roughly the, the time. So it is continuously used. Yeah. Um, and the second part of that question was, was it, there were other sim, are there other similar design diving bells? And I think they were they were used elsewhere. Um, but uh, I think I think uh, Bindens is probably the best. Yeah, and um, Joe Murphy in his oral testimony in that interview um, says he knows of no other place where they used a diving bell like that. So um, now when they used it in the 1950s, um, they may have um, adapted it for doing other things. Uh, it's actual when you see it on one side of it it's it's scoured as if it had been dragged to um to scour the bed floor um so it may have been utilized not for its original purpose when they were used almost, almost dredging oh, yeah in the 50s right. so they, they adapted it and pulled it along i think um so it wasn't used with men actually going down into it um at its latter stages that's my understanding i'm sure there's people out there that know know more about that than than and the, the, final, the final few comments here is a great feedback from everyone. Thank you very much for the feedback. It's a great That's talk, um, Jim. But just uh, maybe it would be a great idea for a die cast model uh, or a paperweight, which uh, a number of people put in. So uh, that's a very good suggestion. There's, there's something that we could uh, have our colleagues in uh, the Epic Museum maybe sell on their shelf. Absolutely. There's, there's, a, there's a beautiful exhibition up at St. Andrew's Resource Centre, and I did mean to mention that um, on Pier Street um, as well, a model of it, uh, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Um, okay, everyone, well, look, I'd just like to finish up uh, before my dog starts to bark too loudly. Uh, to say thank you very much to, to everyone for coming in uh, on, 
on the, such a warm day in Dublin. If you're in Dublin, so please get out there and enjoy the weather. This talk, like the others, will be on our, our YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to take a break during the summer months as everyone readapts to the real world. Um, and uh, we'll be running a series of, of lectures in, in the autumn, which is say Thank you very much to Jim. Thank you to all of you, you for, right. for uh, joining us. Uh, and you have our contact details. And please, if you have any other questions, please do contact us. Delighted to, to respond to you.